Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Siege of Vrax, where the shit is once again about to hit the fan. Last we saw our intrepid and in all due likelihood exceedingly temporary hero, Captain Fodor, he was fully occupied with clenching his tight regulation-clad tush with all the fury and determination his Death Core training could muster. And with good reason as well, considering a starship the size of Tokyo was currently engaged in the act of sodomizing his parent regiment with fusion bombs. But as usual, in the 41st millennium, the bad news doesn't end there. The orbital plastering was merely the hors d'oeuvres, swiftly followed by a dozen or so drop pods filled to the proverbial brim with blood-maddened power-armored zealots. So certifiably insane that they make your average far lefty look sane and centered. This, by all accounts, less than ideal situation must have immediately prompted a pertinent question in the captain's mind. What, in the name of the God Emperor's bed sores, is happening, and more to the point, why was no one warned that this particular cloudburst would include a high chance of cornered fanatics? And rarely has a more appropriate question been asked. One thing, however, was blindingly obvious in the midst of all of the confusion. Someone, somewhere, somehow, had nurtured a fuck-up of biblical proportions, and sadly, Captain Fodor found himself well and truly on the receiving end. But before we wander our happy little asses up into the mountains to look for that most common of creatures, often referred to as a scapegoat, let's see what happened to the unfortunate captain. As mentioned, the poor captain's situation was looking less than ideal. He had recently captured the Vraxian fortification Fort C. 585, on the top of what was known as Mortuary Ridge, a considerable impediment in the way of his own regiment, the 468th. The fortress had fallen after a massed bayonet charge led in part by the captain's own company, reinforced by two further reserve companies from his parrot regiment. The charge had taken place during one of Vrax's many torrential downpours, where the Vraxian sky is simply just hosed down the surface to the point where visibility becomes next to zero. The three companies had then subsequently poured into Fort C-585 through various opening blasted into the fort's side by a Macarius heavy tank. After brief but savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the three Death Corps companies had been able to force the Vraxians to abandon the fort. The fort itself was now being turned into a strong point from which the Death Corps of Krieg could launch further assaults into Mortuary Ridge, with the aim of taking complete control of the ridge off the Vraxian defenders' hands resulting in their parent company, the 468th, being able to move up onto the ridge and out of the extremely exposed valley they had been forced to take positions in after the great push forward had flagged in front of the third and final of Vraxian defensive line. So far, so good. Despite having been severely weakened during the Great Offensive, the 468th Regiment was able to carry out a successful assault upon Mortuary Ridge. The Regiment had previously seized the Vraxian's forward trench lines, but had been repulsed by a massed human wave style assault by the Vraxian reserves. With the seizure of Fort C-585, however, the Death Corps was now in a fortified position and should hopefully be able to see off any further large-scale Vraxian counterattacks. Additionally, the fortress was also ideally positioned to allow the three companies that now occupied it to expand their hold upon the ridge. Miraculously, the 468th Regiment appeared to be winning, there was even the possibility that the Death Court, having gained a foothold within the third defensive line, might be able to capitalize upon this position for yet further gains. By all appearances, this should have been a moment of celebration for the man primarily responsible for all of this, Captain Fodor, who had spotted the precise opportunity at just the right time to push the Death Corps' advantage, and he did so against regulations as well, throwing in the two reinforcement companies before they were fully prepared and ready to be deployed. 
A unorthodox course of action, to be sure, but perfectly timed. However, as with so many times before on this god-emperor forsaken planet known as Vrax, the sweet taste of victory was once again about to turn to ash in the victor's mouth. Unbeknownst to the captain, and incidentally every single other officer on the planet, including the regimental command staff, the line corps command staff, and indeed even the 88th Imperial Guard Army's on-planet command staff, the Chaos Battleship, the Anarchy's Heart, had entered low orbit. It was the cause of the sudden torrential downpour that had provided cover for Captain Fodor and his reinforcement companies, and it was preparing to provide something far less beneficial to the 468th Regiment. It initiated its assault with a brief but devastating orbital bombardment, striking both the 468th Regiment and considerable portions of the Raxians' forward defences. The bombardment was immediately followed up by dozens of Dreadclaw drop pods, filled with bands of cornate berserkers from the Skull Takers and Berserkers of Skalthrax, both elements of what was once the World Eaters Legion Astartes. Normally, a straight-up drop pod assault onto a previously fortified position, as the Death Corps obviously had, would be considered a tad bit risky even by Astartes standards, but, well, the Death Corps hadn't come prepared to deal with even basic aircraft threats. They had, in their paranoia, brought along more anti-aircraft batteries than the Officio Munitorum really wanted them to, but that doesn't help much when they were completely and utterly unprepared to engage the drop pods. A drop pod, of course, falls out of orbit at an incredible speed. Even engaging it while you're ready for it is difficult enough. Trying to engage these plummeting transports whilst utterly unprepared is virtually impossible. Resulting in the Chaos Aggressors landing in amongst the Death Corps completely undamaged. There was, however, at least one small ray of sunshine in amongst all the darkness. Korn's frenzied berserkers are not exactly known for their tactical acumen, even at the best of times, and having arrived in orbit mere moments ago, they had been deployed supremely swiftly, but without much, if anything, in the way of guidance or preparation. This led to the assault being far more scattered than it should have been, several Dreadclaws coming down in the Vraxian defensive lines rather than atop the Death Corps' own positions. And seeing as Corn does not care from whence the blood flows as long as it does, you can probably imagine that the Vraxian defenders' first meeting with their new allies was somewhat less than cordial. Not that this provided Captain Fodor and his men with much in the way of consolation, as they were facing the very same power-armoured killers. Except they were not incidental targets, they were the intended recipients of the cornered fanatic's fury. And whilst certainly this was a counter-attack, something that the Death Court had been expecting, it was of an order of magnitude more horrible than they might have imagined and it flipped the entire battle on its head. Mere moments ago, the Death Corps of Krieg had had the advantage. They were now engaged in trench-to-trench -trench warfare with a solid fortified foothold from which to launch their assaults. Against the Vraxian defenders, the Krieg's guardsmen had every advantage. They had the experience, they had the training, they had the veterancy, they had the equipment, shotguns, fragmentation grenades, and powerful single-shot lasguns. Now, however, their fragmentation grenades, their shotguns, and even the Lucius Patton lasguns were all practically worthless against the power-armoured monstrosities running rampant in their trench lines. The close quarters combat, which had moments before favoured the Death Corps, was now decidedly in the favour of the cornered killers.
Captain Fodor realized immediately that time was of the essence. Every minute that passed, entire squads were being wiped out. He would have to attempt to fall as many of his men back towards Fort C-585 as possible, from which they could possibly organize at the very least some form of effective resistance, supported as they were by the Malkador heavy tank. At least its double-barreled battle cannon and heavy weapons stood a decent chance of killing the blood-maddened berserkers rampaging through their front lines. The only problem was, the cornered berserkers moved with unholy speed. By the time Captain Fodor had managed to organize some elements of his companies to begin retreating back towards the fort, the monstrosities were already charging towards the Malkador heavy tank. The vehicle's top-mounted twin heavy stubber was already blazing out a stream of projectiles towards the approaching berserkers, but it did little more than knock them momentarily off balance the small projectile simply pattering off their power-armoured forms. The hull-mounted heavy bolter had some more success, sawing one of the charging berserkers leg off at the knee. But even then, the blood-spattered creature continued dragging itself through the mud towards the Malkador heavy tank. The gunner panicked and continued pummeling the form into the dirt with a stream of heavy bolter fire, leaving behind nothing but shattered pieces of power armor and a gory mess. This, however, allowed the other berserkers to make their way through what should have been a blocking barrage of heavy bolter fire. The massive tank lurched into life, the driver desperately attempting to lurch the heavy vehicle back and away from the charging Chaos Space Marines, its twin battle cannons still reloading. Its commander's quick decision-making had seen both of the battle cannons unloaded into a Dreadclaw drop pod that landed uncomfortably close to the Malkador. This quick decision-making had almost certainly sent an entire squad of cornered berserkers to meet their uncaring god, but it had left the heavy vehicle without its primary means of defense and it can take an uncomfortably long time to reload a twin battle cannon when you are being charged by power-armored madmen. And in this case, it would be too long a time. The Scalthrax berserkers began clambering aboard the Macarius heavy tank, and whilst its thick armor would prove resolute against any efforts by regular infantry to force its hatches open, against the enhanced power-armored might of the cornered berserkers, they provided no more protection than a tin can, and were swiftly torn open. The commander's hatch was quite literally ripped off its hinges, and a massive power-armored hand reached down inside, grabbing the vehicle's commander by the neck and lifting him bodily out of the vehicle. The corner champion took a second to inspect the feeble creature struggling in its power-armored hands before casually flinging the commander up into the air and then slicing him clean in half upon his chain axe as he came down to the ground. This was all just a little bit too much for the men of the 468th. They had charged Mortuary Ridge previously that day and fought their way into Fort C-585. They had stood ready to repel an enemy counterattack, but this new, seemingly unstoppable enemy that fell directly from the sky and had torn open their heaviest asset with their bare hands was enough to send even the Death Corps fleeing. Meanwhile, inside the fort itself, Captain Fodor had managed to rally a handful of men, along with his own command squad. They fired from every firing slit available, and every hole punched in the superstructure at the charging berserkers. The first Chaos Berserker to enter the fort, dripping with gore, was annihilated by a point-blank melter gun blast from the captain's command squad. Next through the breach, however, was a cluster of hand grenades, which filled the interior of the fort with shrapnel and smoke, swiftly followed by three massive blood-drenched power-armored forms, who came charging into the fort with their chain axes roaring. They made short work of the defenders, including the poor Captain Fodor, who launched himself at the closest Chaos Marine, his power sword crackling into life, but it was battered harmlessly aside by a roaring chain axe. The reverse strike disembowels the captain, and moments thereafter, dazed, bloodied, and slowly bleeding to death, the captain was picked off off the floor by his assailant, 
who calmly, almost gently, lifted the captain up by the shoulder and raised his chain axe to the captain's throat and brought it into whirling, spinning life. The captain's skull would soon be placed atop a pyramid of skulls built atop Fort C-585. What had mere minutes ago looked like a promising break in the third defensive line had been turned into little more than a charnel house of slaughter for the brave guardsmen of the 468th Regiment. And of course, the disaster was in no way, shape or form limited to the 468th. The Chaos forces were raining down all across the Krieg lines, and in addition, capitalizing on this sudden arrival, the Vraxian forces also launched their own counter-offensives. The Death Corps' carefully placed and organized trench lines had been designed to resist any and all attacks from within the Vraxian fortifications, but they had never taken into consideration the possibility of an enemy able to descend upon them from above and deploy virtually anywhere on the planet within hours at most and quite possibly minutes at shortest. The battle had suddenly turned very fluid indeed. Bands of cornered berserkers would fall upon a position, ravage it, and then, lacking the heavy equipment and manpower required to hold it, at least for the time being, would retreat or fall upon another nearby position. In some areas, the Varaxian defenders were able to capitalize on these roaming bands of berserkers smashing apart Krieg positions by moving in their own forces. They had the heavy equipment and the manpower that their new reinforcements, for the moment at least, lacked. As such, several areas along the front line were pushed back, Krieg positions captured, and their defenders forced to retreat and re-entrench themselves in new improvised positions. In other areas, through a combination of stubborn determination, tactical acume, and luck, the Death Court of Krieg was able to hold on to their possessions, which resulted in the front line being broken apart in several areas. No longer was the Death Corps able to maintain the clean, organized form of the trench lines. Instead, in many areas, the Death Corps' holdings had been reduced to individual pockets of defenses scattered across the landscapes, whilst in others the line held firm, and in yet other areas, running battles were still going on with attacks and counterattacks to try and determine how much of the line might be lost, if any, and where, if any, positions could be fortified or retaken. It was, to put it bluntly, an unholy mess. The various assault corps split into their various component regiments and were rushing around like crazy, attempting to close breaches, recapture terrain, and force the enemy back wherever possible, whilst reorganizing and re-establishing control with any areas that may have been left isolated by recent hostile offensive actions. The infantry was equally busy, frantically digging, creating, and refacing their positions, moving around heavy weapons to face to the flanks, to the rear, digging new dugouts, fallbacks lines, communication trenches, securing whatever supplies they could, moving them into more defensible areas, whilst also digging out new positions for improvised anti-aircraft artillery, bringing up additional reinforcements for the guns they did have, begging, borrowing, and stealing whatever AA guns the commanders could get their hands on moving them up to the forward lines and sighting them in, preparing them for yet further combat drops by the enemy. Meanwhile, the heavy artillery was playing up a constant barrage in all directions. Reports were frantic and often broken. It could at once appear as if the enemy was all around and at the same time nowhere to be seen. The artillery would have to provide covering and blocking fire at extremely short notice, while still attempting to husband the often dwindling ammunition reserves that they could safeguard out of the rear line bunkers. In addition, all of the guns would have to be recited not only towards the Vraxian defences, but once again to the flanks and the rear. Covering shots would have to be made, measurements done, and fire zones recalibrated. In a strike of deadly irony, the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was preparing itself to be besieged. And just as if to add the cherry on top, the command structure of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was no less confused. In many areas, the command bunkers 
having been identified from orbit via radio traffic, were under direct assault from Chaos forces. And in many command bunkers, the only things left to man the Voxcasters were the torn and shredded corpses of their previous operators. And for those who yet still remained alive, they had a Herculean task in front of them. Millions of Kriegsguardsmen were out there in the trenches with little to no functional command structure. It would have to be re-established immediately if the new enemy from orbit was to be dealt with. First, the various officers must discover what remained of the old structure, who was still alive, who was in command, and over what and whom. What regiments still remain? Was the artillery still operational? Could supplies still be brought in? How much ammunition was left if it could not? How many lasgun packs? How much fuel? Where were the tanks? Who would even know where the tanks are? Where are they attacking? Are they retreating? What about the grenadiers? Could they be reorganized into fire teams and sent to clear the trenches? What about the engineers? New positions need creating urgently. And the AA? How many guns? How many crews? Where to site them? Concentrate on the Planter HQ, of course. Where is the Planter HQ now? Does it still even exist? Who is in command at the Planter HQ? And if it still exists, how do we secure it? How do we get a hold of the troops? How do we organize? And a million other questions. I hope with that to have demonstrated some small hint of the frantic nature of this moment, because frankly I don't think it is possible to fully demonstrate it sufficiently. To organize a force as large as the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army in such a situation must have been like herding a million sheep, nay, four million sheep, alone, whilst blindfolded after a heavy hit to the head in a hurricane, whilst wolves and lightning strike the flock at random, and, by some mystical coincidence, your underpants are probably also on fire. But there is one question that you, the audience, and the poor Death Court officers probably have in common. Namely, of course, how? Did this happen? Or more precisely, how did a Chaos flotilla achieve low orbit directly above the Krieg siege lines without the Death Corps officers being informed of this rather unfortunate development in orbit? One would after all assume that it would be a bit of a priority on behalf of the Imperial Navy to inform the poor fuckers on the ground that they were about to be rained on by cornered fanatics and other assorted chaos lunatics. But whilst one would certainly assume such a thing, it is far from guaranteed. The Imperial Navy and the Imperial Guard are two very, very separate branches of the Imperial military. They have their own command structures, their own communication channels, and by and large they operate entirely independently from one another. The most contact they usually have is when the Imperial Navy is shuttling one or more Imperial Guard regiments around and occasionally providing supporting fire. But by and large, they are as independent from the Imperial Guard's command structure as the Adeptus Titanicus is. And as many of you may remember from the Death Corps of Krieg video, the Death Corps is a bit of an interesting formation. They have somewhat different opinions and ideas around the Emperor and service than most other Imperial citizens. Considerably more radical and extreme views, to be precise, and most other Imperial servants often find them to be somewhat... overbearing, abrasive perhaps? Overly zealous, um, well they're basically religious lunatics themselves, and we all know how fun they can be to hang around with. Uh, you might even compare them to certain branches of our own world's Islamic religion. Some of those guys can be somewhat overly enthusiastic, shall we say, not exactly the best conversationalists, and the Death Court of Krieg they are definitely leaning heavily in that direction. Thusly, it would not at all surprise me if their relationship with Rear Admiral Raziak in orbit was considerably less than cordial. In fact, I would not at all be surprised to learn that the Rear Admiral and whoever was in overall command down on the planet below had a visceral, burning, intense hatred of one another that would make Hitler and Stalin look like fast family friends.
Now, I'm sure that Rear Admiral Raziak wouldn't be quite so unprofessional as to not send any word whatsoever about the little problem he was having in orbit, but it would not at all surprise me if his personal opinion of whichever Krieg officer was in charge down on the planet below might have affected to whom he sent the warning. For example, he might have sent it off to the headquarters on Thracia Primaris, where Lord Commander Julka himself was sitting. And we all know what an absolute strategic genius the Lord Commander is. It would not surprise me at all if he had decided to withhold this particular piece of information just for the moment until he could, um... Get all the facts straight. After all, no reason to break off a perfectly good offensive on the planet just because there might be some minor chaos incursions. <laughs> I mean, after all, it's not like an army is particularly vulnerable from attack when it's actually in the middle of its own attack, is it? And hell, it might not even be anything quite as... Fancy as the Lord Commander's tactical acume once again rearing its ugly and much loathed head, it might simply be that, well, for the last practical decade, the Lord Commander's staff had had very little to do beyond planning large-scale operations. All the day-to-day decision-making was done by the various Krieg officers on Vrax, because, well, they weren't several fucking light-years away from the battlefield, and therefore had a much better chance of actually making the correct decision. This relative inaction could in turn mean that the Lord Commander's headquarters may have been a somewhat relaxed posting, where new reports often took a little bit of time to get to the relevant personnel, because the relevant personnel might be shit-faced drunk or sleeping off a hangover, for example. And hell, by the time the report actually reached anybody in a position to act upon it, in this case almost certainly Lord Commander Zulke, because you can bet your pretty little ass that any experienced staff officer on his staff would long ago have learned the simple fact that it is best to protect one's ass first. Since Zulke, as we know, have had a little bit of a habit of finding other responsible parties that aren't him. Not exactly the kind of leadership style that breeds initiative, if you get my drift. By the time the Lord Commander had awoken from his afternoon nap and had his second breakfast and maybe gotten a spot of sports in, maybe a little hunt out in the fields of Thracia Primaris perhaps, and finally gotten around to reading the various communiques, which at this point had almost certainly piled up into a nice little tower on his desk, and finally gotten to the one relevant communique about the tiny little detail referred to as a chaos invasion about to hit Vrax, undoubtedly hidden at the very bottom of the pile so as to avoid the inevitable backlash for as long as possible, well, it was all just a tad bit too fucking late, wasn't it? And in all due reality, the only thing that the Lord Commander's staff could actually do at this point in time that would be actually useful, rather than the Lord Commander walking in a small circle in his room, throwing various glass objects at the walls, was to set about ascertaining the sheer scale of the potential disaster in front of them. First and foremost, was the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army even in a position to continue the war at all? Well, luckily for the Lord Commander, the Death Corps of Krieg are remarkable badasses, and odds were pretty good that they would be able to hold on to at least some of their positions and continue the war without being defeated outright, even in the face of an entirely unexpected chaos invasion led by several warbands of Chaos Space Marines. The next question then was for how long the Death Corps could continue to resist. And this was not a question, mind you, about the determination and skill of the individual guardsmen, but rather a mathematical question. How much supplies 
how much fuel, how many lasgun packs, how many artillery shells, and how many reserves were already on planet. Because now, since the Imperial Navy had lost control of the Vraxian system, new supplies and reinforcements could quite obviously not be brought in from outside of the system. To determine then for how much longer the Death Corps could continue to offer resistance, the Lord Commander's staff would have to do something they had not been doing for a very long time. Actually reading the Quartermaster reports that were streaming in from Vrax every day. This was of course the Death Corps of Krieg. They are rather bureaucratic when it comes to warfare. And every single Quartermaster would be writing almost daily reports as to the status of their current equipment, their ammunition reserves, the amount of men they currently had, the reinforcements expected, reinforcements on the way, in transit, weapons replacement, spare parts, etc, etc. Every single minutia was documented and accounted for. Unfortunately, whilst the Quartermasters took their job very seriously, the Lord Commander's staff had not. And so they would have to begin poring over all of the various reports from the beginning of the build-up for the Great Push, and all the way up until today. That was going to be an awfully large mountain of paperwork to climb. It would take days, possibly as much as a week, before the Lord Commander even had a general idea of how long his troops could hold out. Lord Commander Jolke undoubtedly chose to not inform his superiors of this immediately. They didn't have to know just yet, after all. It wasn't critical yet. <laughs> Something could surely be done, right? Unfortunately, there was that one little other thing that had happened as well. Remember Rear Admiral Mazur? and his communique sent to the Board of Inquiry on Cypra Mundi? Yeah, that one. That's the kind of stuff that often comes across the desk of those far higher up in the food chain. And indeed, this particular report flapped its happy little papery arse onto the desk of Lord Commander Segmentum Obscura on Cadia, Julka's immediate superior. Fun fact, when a hippopotamus becomes upset, its sweat changes colour. It takes on a reddish, glossy-ish hue, rather than being transparent as usual. I mention this because I imagine the Lord Commander Obscura's face would at this point in time look frighteningly much so like a vexed hippopotamus. And as we all know, Africa has few creatures more frightful and belligerent than an angry hippo. And the Lord Commander Obscura was about to demonstrate this fact by appointing Departmento Munitorum High Logistician Adept Istar Ornus to head an investigation to determine whether or not the campaign on Vrax had been mismanaged in any way, shape or form. Suffice to say, the High Adept would have ample reading material for quite a while ahead, and many staff officers would find new and interesting postings on the Eastern Fringes, for example, to meet the growing Tyranid menace, whilst yet others would find themselves with fresh challenges leading newly raised formations of penal legionnaires. And yet a few others would become intimately familiar with a small 6x6 and then the business end of a lasgun. Even Lord Commander Julke himself might have to look for a new seat in which to plant his overly generously upholstered tuckus. He was in no real threat of being demoted or even held responsible, however, because once again his family had far too much in the way of political connections. Justice, sadly, remains an infuriatingly blind bitch even in the 41st millennium. And God Emperor help his replacement because he would have quite the mess to clean up.
if and when the Lord Commander was replaced. The sad truth is, however, that despite all of their political back covering and face saving and even occasional bouts of responsibility being handed out in copious quantities, all of this did precious little to help the poor bastards on Vrax, which still had an invading force of Chaos Zealots to face off against. And on that, once again, cheerful note, I think we'll wrap up this video. Expect two videos next week as we detail the new disposition of the forces on Vrax, and how the Death Court of Krieg was going to deal with their new guests, including those disembarking from the Aron's Bane. Because remember, the forces in low orbit weren't the only ones about to make their presence known to the Death Corps. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed this series, please do consider sharing it around to anyone else that might be interested, as I think this is probably the biggest 40k lore series on the web right now. It certainly has grown into quite the monstrosity, hasn't it? Anywho, until next time, have a good day.